mind getting interrupted with questions along the way? I, I, I do not. The, the whole point of this topic is to to spark thoughts. And, and so uh, at any point in doing my presentation, feel free to interrupt and uh, we can pivot and take questions and discuss. Okay. Um, Beverly, have I missed anything? Tony? Um, yeah, bring, bring your own beverage. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> we, we don't have to do here's where the restrooms are or anything. No. So I think we got it covered. Oh, and okay. uh, I'll throw on one thought, Vince, is um, uh, there's the chat, and uh, I tend to try and phrase my questions in the chat and sometimes raise my hand. And I don't know who's going to moderate. Maybe, Vince, are you moderating to watch the chat? Uh, in case. Bever Beverly and I will moderate. I, yeah. I, I hope. Yeah. Gets um, me off the hook. Okay. Yes, um, yeah. and uh, we don't have a speaker for January yet, but we will, and uh, so stay tuned. But uh, mm. here, let's, we do? No, I said who? No, yeah, we, who, I don't know, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, who in Whoville will be speaking, I don't know, but anyway, it's the festive season, so um, we'll, we'll make sure that everybody has a safe and happy holiday. We'll close out later. But anyway, I want to welcome Wim and uh, take it away, Wim. All right. Very good. Thanks, Vince. Uh, and uh, thanks to the, the whole Dig FM group to, uh, for having me. Um, for those who do not know me, my name is Wim Decourt. I run the Claris practice, as we call it, uh, within Solign Consulting. Uh, we, we have four practices, uh, of which the Claris one is the biggest, but we also do Salesforce. Uh, we do custom web apps, um, and we do a bunch of AWS stuff, not just hosting, but AWS consulting as well. So I, I run the, the Claris side of the house. Um, so today we'll talk about choices that we have when we're building or architecting solutions, and specifically um, about how I see that we can now do things and probably should architect things differently than we have in the past. And there's some context for why this is important to me. And I think by extension, important to all of us. Um, a lot of suffering is brought to my doorstep. I, I get to see a lot of ailing solutions, solutions that are not faring very well. Um, I, I, I touch about 80 projects a year myself. So Lion does about, on the FileMaker side, six, 700 projects a year. Um, I get personally involved in about 80 of those. And, and they span the whole gamut of, of industries and all of that but they do often have one thing in common. It's one of those solutions that have grown organically over the years um, and, and it doesn't function in the way that people would want it to function. There's lots of complaints about performance, stability, uh, all of these things. Um, and unfortunately, when, when they get to me, it's uh, it very often feels like whatever we can do is like putting lipstick on a pig, right? It's evolved to the point where it's very difficult to, to do anything mainly because the undoes, right? Undoing the things that, that make the solution ail is, is so expensive. Uh, it's, it's a very difficult sell uh, to, to get a customer to spend money to get them to a place where they think they already are or, or where they think they, they should be, which very often for clients is the same thing, right? So, so they bring the solution to us. We, we look at it and go like, yep, we, we see what we can do but it's going to cost you a fair bit of money to get you back to the place where you 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 have a better solution or a better version of your solution to to continue to grow and be scalable and uh, and all of those um so it and it's at that point very often that the Famica platform gets shunted right because in in the, in the eyes of the developers or or the eyes of the client clearly it can't do what we want it to do so clearly it's not a good platform um so that's sort of like the the backdrop for for this uh, for these opinions that I have about uh, how we can do things, and clearly when I say that when people make that that jump from seeing their solution suffer to PowerMaker isn't the platform for us, that's not always true, right? I, I would say in the majority of the cases that's absolutely not true, um, but it's kind of difficult to to convince them uh, to of of why that is at that point. It's also one of the reasons why. I can get sometimes a little bit pushy on the community forums when it comes to best practices, right? Best practices are not dogmas, and I'll talk about dogmas a little bit further down the road, but best practices are really the condensation of a lot of pain suffered by other people that they've come up with simple rules 
uh, not necessarily for you to follow, but for, certainly to think about, right? When you have choices, you can look at the best practice and say, what could I do? Uh, what, the, what do the best practices say about that? And then you can still make up your own mind, but at least you've, you've put some consideration into it at that point. Right? Because of all that pain that I'm seeing, I do have opinions uh, about how to avoid that pain. And, and what I will propose here um, does not apply to every single situation and every single solution, right? So there's no wrong, there's no right uh, in anything that I'm going to say. I just want us to think about uh, some of the things that I'll put on the table. Um, and, and if you if you dismiss them, that's just fine. But again, same as with best practices, at, at least you'll have given it some thought. And that's really the, all that I'm shooting for. Uh, also be aware that there is not a single simple checklist of how to do things, right? Like if, if that's what you want, if you want a simple recipe that will always work, then you're just shit out of luck, right? There's way too many variables involved in any of this uh, to, to make it simple. It's always contextual. It, it, so basically the answer is very often gonna be, it depends. Before we get into the, into the weeds, there are a couple of trends that I wanna talk you through that may seem unrelated to what it is that we're gonna talk about, but they are related, so, uh, so stick, stick with me. And the first one is this one, right? We come from a situation um, before COVID, although the trend had begun way before COVID, where uh, we, we could mount a solid defense of our assets, our resources, uh, basically at the edge of the network, right? It's an approach that worked really well when there was a clean and very clear delineation between those inside and those outside of the network, right? It's sort of like a, the, the, the moat around our castle were things like firewalls, border routers, intrusion detection systems, intrusion prevention systems, um, but we're not in that place anymore, right? Um, COVID has accelerated that process where uh, identity has become the new parameter, right? It's protecting the identity, protecting uh, and, and knowing for certain who it is that is trying to log into your solution, into your network, uh, that has become the, the new place where you need to, to defend, right? There's of course, COVID has has made it so that we have a lot of remote users. Um, we we uh, if you look at it from the other side, even when from inside our network, we use a lot of remote services, things that are not hosted on our network anymore. And there's this expectation of anywhere access on on any kind of device. Uh, that's another trend that made it so that uh, that the focus on identity uh, as the way to defend is is big and. Uh, one login has this great infographic that sort of shows, <coughs> excuse me, the evolution of of uh, of authentication. Right, authentication is is basically proving that you say that you that you are who you say you are. Uh, and and traditionally, that has been with simple things like a username and a password. That's a thing of the past. Two factor authentication. Uh, it's been it's been there for a while. It's largely a thing of the past because now we're talking about multi factor authentications. Uh, so it's not just something that you know, like your username and a password. It's something that you have, uh, or something that you uh, that you are, uh, if you add in biometrics. And we're sort of at, in this contextual authentication at this point. Right? Even a couple of years ago, Stephen Blackwell and I did a presentation uh, with Apple for um, uh, in, in Washington for governments uh, to talk about these things. And, and and like your phone, your phone knows who you are, right? And, and not just where you are. Your phone knows how you talk, how you walk, all of these things, right? So at some point, the authentication is not going to be a system asking you to provide a username and password and the second factor by typing in a code. It'll basically ask your phone, uh, hey, phone, is that win with you, right? Because because your phone knows that it's with you and, and th that you are who you, who you say you are. So that, that's a big, big trend that, that, is, uh, that is relevant to what we're talking about. Another trend is this one, and we've been seeing that for a couple of years. It used to be uh, because we have this big mix of clients. We have some really big uh, clients that have their big internal ITs, and and you've had some of these. We know how difficult it is sometimes to work with these big IT departments because uh, they have opinions, they have rules, they they insist on certain things. What we're seeing now is that even smaller companies outsource their IT, and the companies that they outsource their IT to are really big IT, right? They have the same reflexes. They they are further away from the business 
than than whatever who was taking care of IT when it was still a small business and everything was still done by the same group of people, right? So the distance between the business and IT is bigger, and these smaller companies with outsourced IT have all of the same requirements that enterprise IT has. And it's a really big trend that we, we've seen in the way that we need to de defend ourselves. We need to explain FileMaker, we need to uh, explain how how and why we do things because they will insist on things like compliance and reporting and uh, all sorts of regulatory things that you typically, you wouldn't find in smaller organizations from the past. Another trend is this one because Pretty much all of us are already doing a bunch of integrations, right? We have our FileMaker solutions and we're integrating already with a bunch of services out there. Um, and, and we do that because we recognize those other systems for what they are. They are solved problems. They Things like QuickBooks, uh, things like MailChimp, uh, all of these things that we integrate with, we do that because they do that thing that they do, they do that really well. And it makes absolutely no sense for us to build that in FileMaker because we can just use that. And all of them uh, at this point in time, they have great APIs. And FileMaker uh, is, happens to be really good at integrating with APIs. So it's a perfect fit uh, ever since FileMaker 16 to consume APIs from inside FileMaker. And like I said, uh, we see this all the time. Uh, many developers live there day in, day out. Uh, and it, it it makes for a, a bit of a simple make versus buy kind of decision, right? Like we wouldn't build an accounting system from scratch in FileMaker. We would just integrate with one that exists, whether it's zero or, or QuickBooks or anything like that. So, so the make versus buy there is, is very, very easy. And to some extent, that is the essence of uh, what I'll talk about later, of what I see that is different between FileMaker solutions these days and FileMaker solutions from five or 10 years ago, right? We come from an era where, where we would try and do everything in FileMaker because, because right? Uh, and now we don't. Uh, and and it's, we're not shifting away from FileMaker, not by a long shot. Uh, we're still keeping FileMaker front and center to do the things that are unique to the business's workflows, but we go look for these things that are already well-defined, solved problems, as I call them, to integrate with, right? So, so that, that is a shift that we've been seeing, and it's a shift that I really like. Uh, so what if we take that shift a little further, right? What if there are things that we now still do inside our FileMaker solutions and that we could potentially take out of FileMaker, right? Uh, not in the sense of it's an accounting part and we'll do that 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 accounting part, not in FileMaker. It's going to be simpler or smaller than that, and then we'll get to that in a in a minute. Uh, so we're going to be looking for things that we... Uh, we can do in FileMaker if we want them to, but maybe we shouldn't, right? Um, and here's the reason that we typically do these things in FileMaker, and, and we all have that, right? So people tend to rely on information or technologies or thing, things that are familiar to them uh, when they make decisions, right? So it's a little bit of a skewed thing where you go like, yeah, I know I could do this not in FileMaker, but I'm going to do it in FileMaker because there's a learning curve on the other side. I don't want to go there. I don't have the time, or I fear that it'll take more time than doing it here, even though that you may, at that, at that when, when making that decision, incur a little bit of technical debt. You know that you'll have to take it out later, or you think you, you know you'll have to take it out later, and then you'll never get to it. Um, so it's a real thing. Um, another way of looking at that is if all you have is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail, right? And um, and that's not a judgment. Uh, we all have that. I, I have that too, right? I'll, I'll go look for solutions within the tool belt that I have um, because why not? It's familiar. That That's the, the first thing that I, that I turn to, right? And again, this is not about ditching FileMaker or saying that we shouldn't be doing things in FileMaker. Uh, it's just to spark... Uh, conversation and discussion around these things. I think we can make FileMaker stand out more by, by sometimes not letting it do things, right? So it's one of those things where less is more sometimes. Um, along the same lines, there's also this and that, right? Uh, the fear of missing out and the fear of joining in. Uh, and these things are real. Um, we see a lot of the fear of missing out these days with AI, right? We talk with our customers and they feel like they should be doing something with AI because it's being hyped uh, and they fear that if they don't do it, their, their competitor will do it. Um, they don't know how to go about it, but it feels to them like they, they should be doing something 
And if they don't, they'll miss out. Um, and, and we see some of that with developers too, right? We've been talking about JavaScript for ages now, and there's 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 developers that go like, yeah, I know I should be doing something with that. And, and will I be left behind if I don't, right? So that's the fear of missing out. The fear of joining in is a little bit of, of the flip side of that, where you go like, I, I know I should be getting into JavaScript, um, but but I don't want to spend the learning curve or I'll spend the learning curve now and then all my my skills will go stale. Um, so um, so I, I won't join in right now. I'll, I'll wait for for a, a better time uh, to do that. So those are two things that are real as well. I think there's a, a big antidote to all of that. Um, and I think this first one, we all have this, right? Every single one of us here is smart enough to learn and pick up new skills. Uh, because after all, we got proficient with the FileMaker platform and, and that's not a, a small feat. Uh, so that capacity to learn is something that that we have. It's a, it's a gift that's, that was gifted to us. And we've mastered the second one too, right? Uh, by being in technology where everything changes all the time, we've learned to learn, right? It's a, it's a skill that we have. It's this third one here that I want to push on a little bit today, right? Uh, do we have the willingness to go there? Um, and I did make up this quote. I, I borrowed this from uh, Brian Herbert there, but I really like this quote. I, I use it a lot when I when I do code review, when I mentor people within Solliance. Uh, we talk about this often. And there's one more thing. We don't think about this enough, right? Um, disaster recovery, business continuity, um, the deployments. I, I blogged about this about 10 years ago. Um, and it's a question that I've asked at many of my DEF CON presentations in the past, uh, where I asked, where I opened with the question, we are good developers, but are we good deployers, right? Um, I think I think that we spend, as developers, we spend way too much time on, the, on thinking about just the development side of things. That's not where the, our clients get, our, get the value from what they what they bill us, right? The client wants to have a problem solved by having a solution created. We create that solution. We spend a lot of time making it the best that we can, and then we deploy it. The client only gets their value after it's deployed. The client gets zero value while we're developing, right? So, so sometimes our thinking is skewed a little bit uh, with that. Uh, we need to make sure that we can deploy in a stable, safe way that wh whatever we deploy is fast, it's reliable, because that's where our clients get their value from. I recently did a follow-up blog post on that because we see that all the time on the forums. A developer gets a complaint from a client and the developer says, it's not really my problem, right? Like it's it must be the server, it must be the network. I don't really care. I did the best that I could. Uh, I, I don't tend to think that way. And then if you read that blog post, a lot of my origin story is, is because uh, when I developed my very first solution and I deployed it, it was a dog. And it was horrible, and I, I I was horrified, and I swore that 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 would never happen to me again. Um, so, which is why I, I do pay a lot of attention to to servers and security and all of that good stuff. All right. So keep that in mind. I, I think sometimes we're too narrowly focused on our stuff and not on the client stuff when it comes to that kind of thing. Um, I want to reiterate: uh, no dogmas, right? So there's not a right, the right way. There's not a wrong way to to think about these things. Um, so keep that in mind as we uh, as we progress. So meet the monolith, because the the topic that we're going to talk about is the monolith versus distributed architecture. So uh, before we go there, we need to define what the monolith is, and, and I'll define the monolith in two different ways uh, that we'll cover. Uh, the first one is the monolith is a FileMaker solution where everything is stuffed into a single file, a single FMP12 file, right? So clearly that's that's a monolithic thing. Um, the second one is where it, it may be one file, it may be multiple files, but we're trying to make FileMaker do everything where we shouldn't make FileMaker do everything, right? So two different uh, variations of the monolith. One is it's a single file uh, that has its downsides. And, and the second one is we're trying to make FileMaker uh, do every single function in the whole solution. And, and we shouldn't. Uh, if our thinking leads us to, to either one or both of these, then the end result is very often a turd, right? So that brings it back to, to the pain that it, uh, or the solutions that are brought to my doorstep uh, that, it, that are causing the clients a lot of pain. Um, very often, they're not turds to begin with, right? They start off their life really well, but uh, functionality gets added, clients get added, uh, data gets added. 
and all of a sudden it becomes this ugly thing that nobody is happy with, right? So when I said no dogmas, uh, breaking up a monolith is not a guaranteed that you'll end up with bliss, right? Uh, you could just break up a monolith and do it completely wrong and end up with this, right? You can end up with with smaller but more poop. Uh, you, you, so that's really not where we want to go. So, uh, like I said, no dogmas. Um, so we're not talking about breaking things up just before because we can, right? The flip side of that is we shouldn't be putting a whole time maker solution together in a single file because you can. Yeah, yes, you can put a million tables in a file maker file. A file maker file can grow to eight terabytes. Doesn't mean that you should go that way, right? Um, because at the end of the day, what makes a good software engineer? Uh, and for me, it's really about options, right? Uh, I think a good architect is somebody who can think through all of the options, who is aware of having different options, and then has the ability to evaluate them and build proof of concepts for these different things, right? So that you can either test them, whether they hold up, or you can build them and prove these proof of concepts and then bring bring them to the client and say, here's a couple of different ways we can go about it. Um, and and let's let's talk about what it means to to go in each one of these directions. All right, so breaking up the monolith, and we're going to talk about that first definition of the monolith, uh, where everything is in a single FileMaker file, all right? Um, and that's sort of like a natural cause these uh, course to take these days, ever since FileMaker Seven, right, uh, where we came from a single file uh, that had a single table to the ability to create a million tables in, in a file. Um, and if we need a uh, functionality that FileMaker doesn't have natively, we turn to plugins, right? I, I'm not knocking plugins, right? No, don't get me wrong. Uh, plugins certainly have their place, but this is sort of like your traditional way of, of building a FileMaker solution these days where people tend to put everything into a single file. Um, and then you end up with something like that, right? And this is not even a huge file. Uh, this is actually taken from an actual uh, client solution where it's a 60 gig file. It's a, it, the whole solution is one file. Uh, and, and there you have it. Um, there's a lot of things that you miss out on when you do that, right? Like when you scram everything into a single FileMaker file and that file then becomes huge, there's a lot of things that we're missing out on. And the first one to think about is every time that FileMaker server, because I'm sort of assuming that this file is hosted on FileMaker server, Every time that you make a change, every time that you create a new record or a field gets changed in a record, FileMaker server has to uh, write out that change. FileMaker server actually uses the operating system a lot for that. So the operating system will lock the file at the moment of the write. Uh, typically, that's not a, a long operation, but on every single write, the file gets locked. So it's kind of easy to see that if you have a busy system that will receive lots of writes, and you have many users doing that at the same time, you've now created a funnel, right? Because the operating system will lock the file for every single write. If you accumulate a lot of these, they'll have to queue up. There's no other way around it um, because you have a single file. So everything has got to go in that file. So keep that in mind because uh, it's one of the things where you can really uh, get better performance by not doing that. Uh, Vince, you have a question? Yeah, <clears throat> my question is, uh, this does this, this uh, also does not just apply to data, right? It's also like, I mean, best practices, you shouldn't be developing on a live system, but this also applies to schema, right? Because it's, it's, it's all in the same file, right? So there is some how it's not separated out, is it? <laughs> No, exactly. Uh, any modification to the file, whether you modify data or you modify schema, is will, will will lock that file at the OS level for however long it takes to get through it. And you actually bring up a good point because a schema lock typically takes longer than a than a data uh, write uh, because when when you change, say, a layout or a script for that matter, any schema elements, uh, FileMaker has to lock the file long enough to swap out that whole schema definition the old one with the new one, which is typically a, a bigger chunk of data than say modifying a couple of fields on a single record, right? So, so your your lock on schema changes is gonna be a longer running lock than, than for data changes. So uh, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. The second thing that you're missing out on is, is the ability that FileMaker Server has that is widely Either not understood or or completely disregarded of being of doing hard links on backups, 
Uh, and the Hartling mechanism has been around since our uh, for probably since Filemaker Seven. Uh, it, it, now, if I try to recall correctly, uh, it's the ability that FileMaker Server has that if a file has not been changed between backup runs, FileMaker doesn't spend any time in this space or, or the, the time to write to basically make a copy of that file. Your backup set is always complete. There's absolutely no worry about that. But FileMaker is smart enough to say, this file hasn't changed. I can just make a, make a hard link to, the, to that little thing on the hard drive that I already have that represents that file. Right? So by breaking up your solution into uh, along the lines of things that change frequently to change to, to tables that don't change frequently, you can achieve better performance on your server by leveraging that hard linking that Thamika has with backups. Um, that 60 gig file that I have, uh, that, that is a classic example of a client uh, running this on a Mac mini and saying, we don't do backups because backups take too long. They take about seven minutes for that file on, on a 2018 Mac mini. Um, and we stop doing that because the users get affected uh, performance wise every when we do our backups. So we don't do backups. Uh, and that brings us back to that thing that, that I said, we don't think of, uh, enough about disaster recovery and business continuity. Because uh, I see way too many developers that say, yep, no, that's that's just FileMaker server sucks. Uh, so we shouldn't be doing backups until FileMaker or Claris fixes the backup issue. And now the client has no backups, right? So um, so that maybe they do a nightly backup, but that we're putting them at risk of losing a full day's worth of data when something happens just because we created a monolith, right? Uh, if we were able to break up that monolith into files, smaller files along the lines of which ones get changed uh, and which ones don't, we would be able to create backups that are a lot more performance. Along the same lines, this is a fairly new feature, parallel backups. Uh, and I'll, I'll have a slide that explains a little bit better. But it's one, it's another feature that FileMaker Server introduced that can make backups go faster. But it only works if you don't have a single file. Same thing with restores, right? Like if you, if you need to restore, if something happens, typically something is going to happen on your biggest, busiest file, right? Uh, I'm not saying that it's guaranteed that your other files are going to be fine, but very often you'll find that that uh, it's typically your biggest of your files, your busiest of the files that is going to uh, get an issue. So again, disaster recovery. Uh, if you can split up your solution along functional lines, along groups of users that need certain functionality, perhaps there's opportunities there to restore parts of your solution and does the business flow for certain groups of your users without having to wait for that 60 gig file to go through a consistency check, which may take an, a half an hour only to, to be concluded that you still have to throw it away, go to a backup, waste another however long to, to copy 60 gigs worth of file, right? So, so there's, there's some opportunity there to restore business operations faster if not everything is in a single file. Go lives can go faster too. Um, we have the data migration tool, which is a command line tool which is very fast at migrating data, you can make it even faster, right? Because it's a command line tool, you can spin up multiples of these at the same time. Uh, a couple of years ago, we actually created a tool around the data migration tool that will analyze your sets of files based on size and then figure out the best way to split them up and run multiple, par uh, multiple parallel data migration tool runs at the same time so you can get to your go live faster than if you had to do a single one, uh, if you have a monolithic file. Darren, go ahead. Yeah, I don't know if it's just at the time, but when I started working with the DMT, particularly the front ends, on a Mac, you could run those multiple um, imports for the DMP through the script. On a Windows machine, we got to a stage where we had to do them one at a time. Um, it seemed to get confused. Um, now, that may have been a year or two ago since I've actually looked at it and re reset things up. Um, but I had a client who had a 40, 50 file solution um, and we had to hit OK after each one so that we weren't working through all of the files at one time. Has that a situation changed for Windows? Um, we've never run into that because I think our tool there, there's a Windows version that works really well for us. Um, I'm not aware of any changes that were made to the data migration tool to to make things better that way. Uh, it just never seemed to be a problem for us. 
Okay, I'll check out your front end, absolutely. All right. So yeah, so you can do th these things. Uh, once we get the patch tool, which is gonna be another command line tool, uh, we'll be able to do the same thing, right? We'll be able to run parallel uh, of these things so, and, and patching files, which will be easier if we have multiple files to patch instead of just one file to patch. Tony, go ahead. Uh, thank you. I uh, I dropped a question in the chat, which I'll flush out. Uh, over the years, we've occasionally had systems that have, you know, kind of stretched the limits of the performance and whatnot. And one of the things that we've done that seemed to work, I want to get your opinion, is archiving uh, transaction type tables where transaction is here defined as like invoices, cash receipts, things that occur, you know, invoices begin, they get closed as opposed to a customer table that would, you know, live forever, uh, hopefully. Um, so I'm just wondering uh, what your thoughts are in terms of the performance advantage of archiving um, faster backups. But I'm wondering what you've seen out in the wild with faster reads and writes. Curious what you think. Yep, uh, it's actually a good question because uh, I, I guess I, I could have caveated that at the beginning. Uh, there's a lot of performance improvement areas that I'm not touching, right? Like the the fact that that you can you can look at at how wide your tables are, how much data you have, which is your point, right? So there's a lot of of efficiencies that you can get by looking at these things that really ha are don't have as much to do with whether everything's in a one file or anything like that. But but yes, there's definitely performance improvements to be had by reducing the amount of data that you have in your system. Your files will become smaller. For for the uh, for the locks, it doesn't for the right locks, it doesn't really matter that much, right? Because um, operating systems are are relatively efficient at locking a file um, or, or even parts of a file for for doing writes. Um, so so that wouldn't benefit from having a, a smaller file because a, a, a file lock is a file lock is a file lock. But you'll get performance benefits otherwise, like faster backups, faster restores some internal functions that are just going to be faster by not having FileMaker work through that much data. That was, that was interesting, particularly the part about rights. And uh, so just one final thought uh, is that uh, we, we don't do it as a matter of course. We kind of hold off as long as we can before splitting off an archive file to make sure that the files is built out as possible. So we don't prematurely optimize. We've done it occasionally. Uh, anyway, thank you. That's good insight. Yeah, and, and archiving data always brings up the question, like what if the client still needs to look at that archive data, right? Because now you have to build extra functionality to, to have this other file open and pull data from and for reporting and, and whatnot. So uh, so archiving isn't always an easy solution, uh, right? It's it's one that we, 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 we always think about and we, we discuss that with the client, but it's not always easy. Yeah, it's like, um, just to agree with you, it's, uh, yeah, it's an archive still hosted and it's just kind of called on demand and you have more functionality to be able to, you know, get reporting that, uh, you know, where you occasionally want to go back and get like customer history kind of on demand, but not, not part of the core opening routine. Uh, yep. anyway. All right, cool. Yep. All right. Uh, another benefits that you can get from, from breaking up your file into, into multiple files is that you can think along functional lines and, and, and have some modules, if you will, right? So that makes it easy to share some code, uh, even between solutions. There's actually, at Engage in Austin, there's going to be at least one, I think maybe two sessions on, on, on the concepts of modularity and where we are these days with FileMaker to do that, right? So that's another uh, uh, way of looking at, at not putting everything into a single file. A quick word on that parallel backups, right? Um, because it's a fairly new feature um, that maybe you haven't looked at. Uh, in order to know what's different, we need to understand how FileMaker typically backs up, right? So FileMaker backs files up sequentially. It starts with file one, works its way through file six. So they, it doesn't happen at parallel, it's, it's sequential, right? So, so the more files you have, uh, actually, no, I'm not gonna go there. Uh, so this is how FileMaker backs up. Right. If you have a single file, it's, there's really no sequentiality to it. It's just a single file. But if you have multiple files, that's how it works. Now, parallel backups, FileMaker server is smart enough to understand which files are logically grouped together and logically defined as which files get their commits, their data changed in roughly the same time. 
right? Uh, they call them transactions. Uh, we're not talking about 1906 style transactions. It, transactions just defined as data changes. Uh, but file maker server will observe your files and logically group them based on which files get changed at roughly the same time. Uh, and it'll, it'll create groups for those. And it can then back up each group in parallel. Within each group, the files are still backed up sequentially, but now you can have multiple of these groups being backed up at the same time. The net effect is that your overall backup time gets shorter. Uh, so that's how parallel backups work. We, we have no control over these groups, right? This is basically just FileMaker figuring it out. Um, so it takes a while for FileMaker to catch on on how your solution is being used. And it may change over time as, as patterns change within your solution. But that's how parallel backups works, right? So, so the net effect is that your backups uh, become faster. And I'm not blind to the counter arguments, right? So if one FileMaker file versus multiple FileMaker files, there's arguments uh, to say uh, don't, uh, there, there's, there's compromise, right? There's no such thing as a free lunch. Uh, when you break up your solution into multiple files, there's things you have to accommodate, right? And and it, it's very often in these elements, right? The common schema elements that that when you have a single file, you only have to do them once. If you have multiple files, you have to do them multiple times. Um, and that's a, that's a big argument that I hear from developers of not wanting to break their solution up in multiple files. Keep in mind what I said at the beginning, right? Should we be too focused on these things because they make our lives as as developers easy, or, or should we take into account what the effect is on our clients, on disaster recovery, on, on performance, all of these things, right? Uh, I tend to see that developers tend to overly focus on, on why it makes their life easier by not having to do these things multiple times. Um, and I don't always agree. Uh, but I'm not blind to the fact that, yes, you, you have to redo some of these things, right? Custom menus, sometimes are a pain, custom functions, but really how often do you change a custom function, right? Certainly with privilege sets, the fact that you have to create privilege sets in each, in each file, privilege sets are, are targeted or should be at least, I'll be talking to in, engage in Austin uh, specifically about security and basically revisiting privilege sets and why we should pay more attention to them. Privilege sets are tailored to what the table is and what the records in that table are, right? So the fact that you have to do that in a different file because they have different tables, I don't really see that as a big burden. And certainly when it comes to accounts, right? These days, remember that trend that I said that the identity is the new parameter and that uh, IT departments are, are putting a lot of efforts into making sure that the identity, the authentication is a big, big deal for them. They want compliance reporting. They want multi-factor authentication, all of that stuff. And by virtue of smaller companies outsourcing their IT, that's now a demand there too. FileMaker is great at using external authentication, right? To me, it makes no sense whatsoever to make your solution, to make FileMaker an identity provider. Your solution should not be an identity store. You should be using an identity store that is already being used. And when we're talking about smaller companies, maybe it's it's we do well as a consultant to introduce one that will give them all of the benefits of, of that identity as a new parameter, right? Compliance reporting, a multi-factor authentication, a passwordless authentication, passkey authentication. These are all things that you inherit for free when you go and, and pick one of these identity providers that FileMaker Server is excellent at. I, uh, uh, integrating with. Uh, the, the list that you see here on the screen is not an exhaustive list. These are just the one, the identity providers that we have already used at Soliance with our clients, right? So it, it's become one of these things where either the client already has one and we can use it, or we can introduce one uh, when the client doesn't have one and we're doing the client a real service by going that way. All right, so this was really all about that single FileMaker file and why we shouldn't do everything in a single FileMaker file. So when it comes to breaking up that, that single file into multiple files, um, what is it that we're looking for, right? So we we want to find the breakpoints, the delineations within the solution that would give us the best performance, right? Busy tables, not so busy tables. Um, because of the of the the, the locks on writes, the the the, the way that FileMaker server can do backups, 
uh, we want to think about what gives us the best disaster recovery, business continuity opportunities for our clients, right? How can we get our clients or our sections of the clients back up and running quicker uh, by, by structuring our solution in, into different files? And uh, reusability, modularity of some of our code is another uh, way that we can look at some of these things, right? So, so that was part one. The monolith being defined as a single file maker file, and why we shouldn't uh, go that way. Actually, I have a question about the um, your your strategy for how you would break things up so that it would make the most sense. I mean, can you give an example of of what considerations you would give? Sure. Um, a really good example, uh, and I was working through one of those this morning, um, uh, an audit log uh, table in your solution, right? Um, we see many solutions that have one. Um, if you have a monolithic file and you have an audit log, uh, depending on, on, on how big your solution is, but say that it's a fairly comprehensive solution with different functional areas, but if you're audit logging and you're logging everything to a single uh, audit log table, that is gonna be your weakest point, right? Because it doesn't matter where else in your solution the writes happen, every write elsewhere in the solution gets accompanied by a write to the audit log table, right? Um, that is a big, big funnel. Just taking that audit log table and putting it in its own file is sort of like instant performance boost, right? Because that audit log table can, can get locked on its own writes, right? That's fine. But it, now it doesn't hold up rights to the rest of the solution anymore, right? Um, you could potentially even consider having multiple audit log files for different parts of the system. Um, and I said multiple audit log files, right? Not multiple audit log tables, um, because you you want to look at at some of these things. Um, a, a good way to to look at these things is looking at the top call stats log, uh, right? And and really finding whether there's <clears throat> there's evidence there of of, the, of those funnels and then looking for those tables and and finding them um really busy tables right if if you have um for instance if you have an invoicing system with invoice and invoice line items right the invoice line items table is typically going to get more rights than your invoice table right maybe maybe you could split that up into its own file right so these are some of the examples uh, of what we looked at for clients of how you would break these things up in, into um, in, into uh, uh, different different files. When it comes to to backups, um, it's going to sound like a nonsensical example, uh, but but I think it, it it's 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 a good example. Uh, say that you have a um, you have a table with uh, say postal codes, right, or zip codes. Uh, or something very similar that is a big table potentially, but it's a static table. These things don't change very often, right? Uh, that's a, a very easy way that you can say, I can take that table with all of its data and put it in its own file, right? Because between backup runs during the day, that table is, and, and does that file is not going to change, right? So, uh, so you can be looking for these things with the knowledge of your solution during the day or during an hour, uh, say that we 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 think about hourly backups during the hour, which tables typically gets changed and which ones don't, and then look for, for ways to split up your solution along those lines. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Um, can I give another example and maybe you can, can criticize it or not, you know, so a long time ago, we had this like one large monolithic file that did, you know, maybe the bulk of the work that in an in-house solution, but we also had like a couple dozen other solutions that were standalone. Each one of them had their own, um, you know, bio biographical information on on the customers that, that are there. Um, and we find, of course, that there's a lot of overlap, you know, because it's an, at a school. So you have a lot of people for admissions, but they're also may be overlapping with enrollment, which may also be overlapping with graduation. And we said, well, maybe we should just like take all this all the biographical information and just biodemo information, stick it all in one table so that all the emails and the names and the <laughs> you know addresses all just in one place. And then everybody just refers to that file and that file 
it is no longer the admissions file. It's no longer the graduation. It's just a shared file that everybody uses. And we did that with another group because there's a lot of translation tables, uh, you know, like dozens and dozens of them. And they were like, and I was thinking about those and I said, you, you, I said, well, you know, all those tables, there's nothing private about them. I mean, you could literally put it out on the internet and it wouldn't matter because they're just translating, you know, like school codes and states and, all kinds of things, but it, it, there's nothing, pri no, there's no private information there. So I thought it would be kind of nice just to have one table that nobody, no one ever has to log into, or, or it's, it's just read only for everybody. And, and, um, and so it wouldn't matter who on campus could, uh, needed to get at it. They could open it up and they would log them in through that active directory, no matter who they were, just so they could see that data. So, so we, we kind of broke things up based on partly on, Organ organization security. Uh, does that make sense? Uh, it, it does make sense. Quickly right? like and, that? Yep. Um, the, 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 the consideration that I would make, like if you, if you have a, 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 like a person table or like say biographical data um, and you have one of these tables in, in different versions or, or different solutions, um, if there's a lot of data duplicated in those, then that would make sense to, to create just one table or one file uh, with one table that, that has some of those so that you can avoid that duplication of data. Um, if, However, if putting it all in a single table means that you're now sort of like overloading that one table with, with a lot of, of writes, like if that data gets changed often, uh, you may be introducing uh, a performance penalty that is going to be felt by all the users of, of all these different solutions that they wouldn't have if they, they, if they had their own copy of it, right? So that, that would be the consideration that I make, whether it's, it's a good idea or, or a bad idea. Like from a data duplication point of view, it's absolutely a good idea. Uh, if they typically have their own like subset of data with minimal overlap and the data doesn't change to the extent that this this table wouldn't be like one of the busier tables in the solution, then then it would be a good idea. If by combining that you've now created a, a busy busy table, then I would I would say maybe not not a not a good idea. Oh, thanks, that's a good consideration. In this case, of course, it's just um, it's actually a mirror of of enterprise data that we download nightly and maybe update here and there now and then for some people. But um, yeah, so that thanks, that's good. Yep. Tony, you had a question there? Um, yeah, th thank you. Um, uh, so first off, huge fan of the multi-file architecture for, you know, solutions of, you know, past a certain point. Uh, so I have a, basically a supportive comment that I think it's a terrific idea and maybe leading into an interesting question pertaining to privilege sets. Uh, mm -hmm. The four things that you put up on the screen a moment ago, custom menus, custom functions... Uh, privilege sets. I forget the fourth, but privilege sets. Accounts, so here, yeah. here's my question. Would you say, I know you've set up a lot of security systems for sure, for sure, right? It seems to me that uh, privilege sets actually get easier to set up in a multi-file architecture. If you're, if you're dividing your files based on scope, you know, where the shipping file is separate than the customer, the CRM file, for example, you know, et cetera, that due to the inherent architecture of the FileMaker privilege set structure, that privilege sets actually get easier. So I just want to put it out there that multi-file privilege sets seem to be easier. And I guess the follow-up question of that I'm curious what you're thinking is, first time we did a big, big, big privilege set back in the day when FileMaker 7, I think it was 7, when they came with the new privilege set architecture, you know, we were all sitting around looking at it for the first time thinking like, do we set up our privilege sets based on you know, how high, like a, maybe 10 different privilege sets that escalate up in terms of capability, full access, admin, power user, user. Um, anyway, that's just food for thought. It's a little complicated topic, but multi-file architecture for the win, for sure. I'm yeah, just curious I'll, what I'll, your thoughts are. Yeah, I'll, I'll uh, briefly on, on the second item that you mentioned there, uh, like the, the, the number of privilege sets and, and, and the thing, I'll, I'll talk about that in, in Austin. Um, as part of my, when I do BA work or, or uh, talking about creating a new solution or re-architecting an existing solution, I, I always use a security matrix. I, I do that in Excel so that we have something to refer back to. Uh, uh, 
we should we should have the least number of privilege set, right? Because every privilege set is a role, and you should only have as many roles as as are defined by what users need to do in the system. Um, so th that that's my quick thought on that one. Uh, and I tend to agree with you that setting up privilege sets in multiple files is actually easier because it's easier to wrap your brain around what you're looking at for that file. Um, and what I often see is, is a misconception that if you have multiple files, that you need to duplicate each privilege set and each role and in, in, in all the files. That's not true, right? Because a role in one file will, will be specific to the tables in that file. Whereas uh, you may only have like like if if you have invoices and invoice items in one file, uh, but you have addresses in, in in another file, just making stuff stuff up, uh, you may have different roles as as they pertain to to interacting with invoice and invoice line items, but you maybe only have one or two roles as it pertains to to interacting with with address information, right? So uh, so there's no there's no reason why you would have the same number of privilege sets in all the files. Um, so you need to think about how are users interacting with this data from this table and just create the, the privilege sets that, that account that. So, so to that point, yes, it's it actually is simpler um, from a grouping point of view to, to, uh, to break that up. Yeah, so I, lo I look forward to what you do in Austin. So my closing comment would be the first time we did this, or actually the second time we did it, we had a use case where people had high privileges in one file and low privileges in other and vice versa. Yeah, and so absolutely. that does, um, uh, anyway, I look forward to the presentation that you're doing in Austin. Yep. Um, all right, Branham, Branham two. Yeah, so I'm Jim Branham. Um, at our company, we had uh, this sort of a lead into a horror story with multiple files and then trying to combine resources into a single file is uh, we have uh, this particular developer group has three production servers, two, excuse me, yeah, three production, two development, and one QA server. And they developed a uh, what they called a login universal file because they wanted to collate the logins to all these various files that had their own log of people logging in and out, somewhat along the lines of an audit file, but specifically oriented toward people who use it. So while the integration was great, uh, one of the things that they didn't understand was they've now not only created a single point failure, but you have absolute uh, file references um, that exist uh, in your uh, external data sources so that trying to move files from development to QA to the various production servers suddenly became a real problem because everything wanted to talk to the production version of this login file. Um, and so realizing the limitations uh, of breaking things into multiple files, at least as far as I understand it, maybe you can, uh, members of the group could reflect on this, FileMaker server cannot reach out beyond itself to do various functions, um, but you, certainly the FileMaker client uh, can do so. So it looks like it may be a, a, a fine solution, but in fact, if you're trying to execute anything on the server, it becomes a real problem, as well as a single point failure for the whole system. Uh, it's it's a good point that you bring up because it's a, it's a it can be a two edged sword. Um, we've actually solved performance issues at clients by actually using using multiple servers, right? Um, because it's the operating system that does a lot of the of the of the file locks uh, in, in order to facilitate writes. Uh, like if you have really one file that is so busy, um, you can actually get some benefit by, by putting it on its own server so that that the OS only has to account for that file. And keep the other files on, on another server, or even use two, three, four servers, because uh, then you can also uh, use all the resources for for those servers. Um, so you can get some definite performance benefits from doing that. Um, the The downside could be if you do things like schedules or or things that run server side PSOS or something like that, and you you need to jump from server to server. Uh, a server cannot be a client to another server. Uh, that, that has been around since forever. So you do have to be careful which files you put on what server in that respect. 
Um, the, the file reference is this day that's a solved problem, right? Like you, you can you can use variables for for uh, file references. So the ability to take a solution and move it from from dev to test to UAT to to production, uh, and while preserving and not mixing file references, uh, that really shouldn't be a, a big issue these days. Um, but yeah, so you can get a benefit from using multiple servers, uh, but there, there are certainly certain considerations to take into account when you do so. Right. Now, one clarification. Yeah, we, we do use the, the variable uh, method for pointing things, but the equation or the value list uh, that you use uh, is going to be something that you have to modify as well uh, for each file or for each server, if you have, let's say, a resource file that says, okay, here's all of the servers that you need to be aware of, uh, because we are, uh, you know, continually adding and then dropping some older servers as we try to, you know, move forward with uh, various versions. And uh, so that list needs to be maintained. So just beware that somewhere uh, behind that equation that you put in for your um, uh, computed uh, external data source uh, is a formula or data table somewhere that needs to be maintained. Sure, absolutely. Vince? Uh, yeah, thank you, Wim. Um, just a uh, great discussion. I just wanted to say that uh, uh, in the past, when you looked at separation, it was the topic was a separation model. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, again, uh, what we were just mentioning before about replicating privilege sets. Uh, I think that goes back to that topic where I have an interface file and I have my data in another file. And, um, you know, some people are, uh, you know, some people were adamantly for the separation model and some people were adamantly against it. Uh, but, you know, I'm I'm more of the, the type where I, I don't don't believe it works well just because there's some security concerns that are uh, issues that I've seen come up. But um, what I do like is this idea of separation for purpose uh, much more. And I wanted to ask you a particular question. So that, that's more particularly a comment. But the question I wanted to ask you is, now that we have transactions, um, does that improve the locking on the file? Because I guess when a transaction is running, you, you're able to stuff more data through the, you know, I guess, the pipeline, and then and then get committed, rather than, you know, if you're doing a large import, it does it in batches, and you're you're, you're I, I don't know how the system writes and locks the file. Does it write it and then lock it because that batch is done, and then it, it opens it up again to write it again? I I just I don't know enough about the innards. To know that, but I'm wondering if if you have some sense if transactions help mitigate the issue of reading and write a lot of a locks. <clears throat> yep. Um, a, a quick thought on, on the data separation. Um, the yeah. So, so the separation uh, that we're talking about in breaking up the, the file wouldn't be just the, the UI versus the, the data. It's really breaking up the data. Uh, and like you, we've never bought into the data separation model because the promise never felt like it was coming true, at least not, not in, in the amount of work that we did on solutions. Um, but but some, of the, some of the trepidations and some of the discussions around duplicating some of the schema elements are, are exactly the same, you're right. Um, transactions, the answer is gonna be, it depends, but transactions should uh, have a beneficial uh, impact on, on, the, on the rights. It uh, kind of depends on how big you make the transactions clearly. Um, but by by stuffing more things into a single uh, file lock, in essence, because that's what you're doing, right? You're locking a file and then you're writing and then you're unlocking the file. You, you're 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 minimizing the overhead that comes from locking and unlocking, right? So um, th there's going to be a crossover point by where you're stuffing so much time, so much stuff in, into a single transaction that 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 the overall time uh, or the overhead uh, is is it becomes meaningless versus doing multiple of those. But in general you should get a benefit from using transactions. Okay. Um, I have a follow-up comment I wanted to ask, um, and that is um, with, uh, with with regards to, uh, you know, so if you have a separation and you have your audit log in one file and you have your, your data in, a, in another file, um, I, you know, scripting is multi-threaded. 
but writes are single threaded. But if you have the writes happening in multiple files, then in a sense that's multi-threaded, isn't that? Is that correct way of thinking about it? Yes, you, you'd uh, you'd have to come up with some. For for instance, say that you you're you're making a change to to an invoice, right? and you're also logging that, and your invoice is in one file, and and your your audit log is in another file. <clears throat> uh, in 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 your scripts, when you make the change to to the uh, to the invoice, and you commit, uh, you're basically generating a lock on the invoice file and then unlocking that file and then you move on to writing your your uh, your uh, your audit log file your invoice file is now ready for somebody else to, to make a change right uh, in in your overall scripting your funnel is still going to be your audit log right because that that is still the thing where things may get queued up so so your script the total execution time of your script uh, may not be shorter by virtue of you're just moving your funnel from one file to the other one, it may be right because it kind of depends on on what other funnels you, you have going on in in your monolithic file, which typically you will have multiple funnels uh, versus that one funnel in, in one file. Um, so, so it may not be a silver bullet for the overall performance, the total performance of your script running, right? So sometimes you may have to come up with a with a different strategy where you you basically uh, uh, do some queuing mechanism for for your audit log writes, right? So that you can then process in them and 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 sequence and, instead of trying to do it in parallel and have the parallel things get queued up uh, for for their writes. So um, so there could there can be sometimes some complexity to to thinking through that completely. Okay, thanks. All right. So part two of breaking up the monolith is, is um, not about a FileMaker file that has, or a FileMaker solution that has everything in one file, like what we had when we when we uh, do that. And then we, we think about using plugins for, for extra functionality. It's more along the lines of what, what I said, where we are already integrating with existing systems out there because they solve a problem for us, right? So this is where I said, well, would there be things, let me go back, I was going too quick. Would there be things, uh, functionality in our solution that we could consider taking out and not doing FileMaker, right? So breaking up the monolith here would be taking pieces of functionality out of FileMaker and not doing them in FileMaker, right? So, uh, and typically the, the way that you go about that is you would you would have your FileMaker solution and then integrate with something like a microservice, right? Something that is easy for FileMaker to integrate with, and FileMaker is great at, at integrating with APIs. Microservices are nothing more than a web server that has some code running that you can, you can talk to as if it were an API because it's an, it's an API. Uh, and then, of course, you can reuse some of that from other FileMaker solutions, but also from, from non-FileMaker solutions, you can call on the same microservices. But uh, we're going to focus on, on just the FileMaker bit there. And here are some some use cases of how we've done that to great effect already uh, with existing customers, right? PDF generation is, is a prime example. FileMaker is fine at generating PDFs. Nothing wrong with how FileMaker does that. Um, but it's it can it can be a burden. If you generate enough PDFs, um, it could be the thing that slows your solution down. We worked with a client um, who was ready to ditch FileMaker, um, very busy solution. It's in a medical space, and they were generating tons and tons of PDFs uh, every hour, almost every minute, out of their system. Um, and they, they come to the, to the conclusion that FileMaker wasn't the platform for them because it was way too slow. When we looked at it, um, we, we identified the, the act of generating the PDFs, the physical writing, generation and writing of the PDFs to be the single biggest pain point in their solution. And by taking that out of FileMaker and basically using a PDF writing library and just writing that as a microservice and just feeding the data to it so that that can now be, be done uh, outside of FileMaker, we basically solved the issue, right? Because the issue wasn't that FileMaker wasn't good at what, what, what they were doing. FileMaker was actually excellent at guiding them through their workflow. It was just the PDF generation was the thing that slowed them down. And the PDF generation wasn't the core of their issue, right? Yes, it was the most visible output of their system, 
but it, that wasn't what what they what 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 the value of of Farmaker was to their solution. The value of using Farmaker was the ability to to fine tune their workflows because the value was in going through those workflows. The end result of which was a PDF. Uh, so we took the PDF generation out. We did that as a Node.js microservice. And because it's a microservice, you get you inherit all of the, the things you get from that, right? We can now have multiple of these. We can scale them up and down as we see fit. Uh, if they have a, a big load where they need to generate a thousand PDFs in, in an hour, we can spin up more machines. We can, even within the same machine, we can spin up multiple versions of that microservice and, and have that taken care of. The same thing with very complex JSON queries. If you if you have to work with a big chunk of JSON and you need to parse that, FileMaker is good at that, right? Again, this is not something that FileMaker cannot do, um, but it can be slow. Um, if you have to do partial matches, aggregation uh, across uh, JSON elements, uh, there's excellent jo uh, JSON parsing libraries out there. JSON Auto is one of them that that flies when, when you have to do this stuff. So this is one of these things where you can do that outside of FileMaker, just feed it to JSON and bring the result back into FileMaker. Um, XML to JSON and JSON to XML conversions. We, we do a fair bit of that. If you work with older systems and bigger companies, SAP is a prime example of that, uh, where, you, where you want to uh, do things in FileMaker and generate JSON, but you have, the end result has to be XML. Uh, or the other way around, where you 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 can get XML. Yes, you can write XSLTs and parse it that way. But sometimes it's easier to get the XML transformed into JSON, so that I can use the FileMaker fun JSON functions to parse that out. Um, trying to do XML to JSON conversions or the other way around in FileMaker is 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 not pleasant. When you do this in JavaScript, um, this is the complete code for an endpoint of a microservice API that can do that. Right, so these what do we got four lines of code, um, and really the magic is in line eight, right? So that that last bit dot JSON of your XML, that's all it takes for, for JavaScript to transform XML into JSON. It's really that simple, right? And so uh, that's one of the benefits of not doing this in FileMaker. Uh, you one you get blazingly fast performance, and the code is that simple, uh, and that really applies to any any format conversion, right? Whether it's CSV to JSON, JSON to CSV. Um, any any of those. We know that FileMaker isn't a computational powerhouse. Some of that uh, shows itself in, in the JSON parsing routines. But other than that, when it comes to pure computational uh, prowess, FileMaker isn't the fastest. So anytime you have a, a use case that, that needs that computational powerhouse, you can choose to not do it in FileMaker, right? Um, We've worked through some of that where you, where you had to do lots of simulations, uh, lots of iterations over the same data to come up with different things. It's easy to do uh, by not doing it in FileMaker, right? Um, same thing with text manipulations. Uh, regular expressions is not something that's built into FileMaker. Yes, we have it in plugins. Uh, same with PDF uh, generation, by the way. There, there's plugins that that have PDF writing libraries built into them. But you're still taxing FileMaker by doing that, right? If that's the pain points, then you can do it outside of FileMaker a, a lot more easy. We have some other ones there uh, that fall in that same in that same category. One of the big benefits of doing things not in FileMaker is that now you can get the benefit of doing a lot of these things asynchronously, right? So FileMaker can give the instruction to that other thing, and FileMaker can move on. Right, that other thing when it's ready, you can talk back to FileMaker to the data API, ODA API, ODBC, JDBC. Doesn't really matter. FileMaker server has enough APIs for it to talk back to say, "I'm done. Here's my result." Um, doing things async in FileMaker, we can do that now a little bit, right? We have to perform script on server no wait, which is one way of doing things asynchronously in FileMaker. And now that we have the perform script on server with callback, that's really a a, a big benefit. Uh, but again, you're still taxing FileMaker, right? So we don't need to, to look outside of FileMaker just for the benefit of being able to do things asynchronously. We can now do that in FileMaker. But if FileMaker performance is, is, is premium or it's the thing that can make the FileMaker performance tip over, uh, we can get that benefit from not doing things in FileMaker. Um, 
Another uh, use case is that if the other thing has an SDK that you can use, right? Um, uh, we, we use the AWS SDK for this a lot, right? So instead of, uh, if you have an API that is well-documented, you can make all the calls to those API from inside Pharmac. Not a big deal. Pharmac is really good at that. But if the other service, if the other thing has an SDK, sometimes it's better to stand up uh, your own microservice to use their SDK because now you can benefit from all of the code that they've written um, and just call it from inside FileMaker. Now, I'm using AWS as an example because if you ever had to authenticate against an AWS service, you know it's a big pain. Um, if you use their SDK, then all you need is a .env file where you put some environment variables like your uh, like your AWS key and uh, access key and, and your secrets. Then in your JavaScript code, all you have to do is basically call a new, and this is an S3 client, because the code that I'm showing here is for restoring an S3 object from a bucket uh, or from Glacier back to a regular bucket. Um, so what I'm doing there is uh, calling an S S3 client and I'm referring to my environment variables and that's all the code that I need to authenticate. And when I need to restore the buckets, it's really line one and line three that are the relevant pieces of code, two lines of code to say, uh, here's my new command, send my command and I'm done. Right, uh, trying to do these things, the authentication and calling these commands from inside FileMaker, you can. Right, I'm not saying that you cannot or that you shouldn't, but it's a whole lot easier when you use an SDK like the one that AWS has when you do that. So, think of the pieces of functionality that you have in your FileMaker solution, and I'm not talking about the services that you can integrate with. Right, like the last example there with the AWS SDK was sort of like straddling the line a bit because. S S3 is a service. Uh, PDF generation is a better example, right? Because that's really not a service, although you can probably find a PDF generation service, but I'm talking about more pieces of functionality for which libraries exist that do that thing really well. And find and, and looking at your solution and say, is there an opportunity? Should I, could I, should I at least consider not doing that piece of thing functionality in FileMaker? And had offloading that to a to a library, um, and uh, basically going the um, the microservice way. Uh, within Soliant, we had a bit of an interesting journey in in uh, making more of our developers think about that. Um, and clearly, when you when you write your microservice, you got to write it, and and you have to pick a tech stack, right? Uh, we use JavaScript because there's a lot of synergies to be had by using JavaScript. You can use Python, you can use Ruby, you can use Java, you can use .NET. There's a lot of tech stacks that that can build microservices. We would we tend to prefer JavaScript because we can use JavaScript for other things in FileMaker. And we thought that the thing that would was holding our developers back was the JavaScript knowledge. We thought that was the single biggest stumbling block, the ability to acquire the JavaScript skills, right? Writing JavaScript. Turns out that wasn't the thing that was holding us back, right? It was all the practical stuff. So you're a developer and you've you've considered that there is a library, a JavaScript library, say PDF generation, that you think you can use, right? You're sitting at your machine, you have FileMaker on your machine. How do you go about that, right? How do you build that stuff and run it? And quickly, because you're an architect, you're a software engineer, you want to build it just to see whether it would work, right? And you want to be able to do that on your machine. How, how do you do that, right? That's the stuff that was holding our developers back. And then next to that was, okay, if we can solve that problem and you can write that code on your own machine and run it so for your testing and all of that, but once your code is ready, how do you deploy that, right? So those are the challenges that were the biggest uh, hurdles to overcome when it came to uh, to getting our developers along that path of of thinking that because we found that a lot of our developers said, yep, I could do this, not in FileMaker, but I don't know how, right? Conceptually, I get it. And I know that it could be done and I could probably find another developer who can write it, but I'm not capable of doing that. I don't know the mechanics of putting that together and running that, right? So, so that was the thing. Really quickly, I won't get, get in, into that too deeply uh, because otherwise we'll run out of time, but a microservice is really nothing more than a web server. Right? It's a web server that sits there listening for something and then sends back a response. Right, In the middle there, between receiving an instruction and then sending something back, it's got to execute something. 
Um, and and that execute executing something, that's where you have to pick your tech stack, right? And we we pick JavaScript for these things. Um, so, so your challenges are really going to be, how do I write that microservice? Uh, how do I deploy that microservice? Uh, and all of that stuff. Um, and I can do a whole presentation on, on overcoming those challenges and showing how to do that. Uh, Vince may have seen me do some of that stuff in, at, um, uh, in Montreal, I think uh, this year, there must have been this year, where I did a presentation on, on just doing that. It's, it's fun to give that presentation, but I won't get into a lot of detail here. Um, but I want to take it a little further, right? Um, because typically when you have a microservice and you've written one, when you go to deploy that, you got to deploy it on the server. You can pick your FileMaker server. You can actually deploy some of that stuff on your FileMaker server. Got to be a little careful with that, right? Because if we're trying to solve performance problems on your FileMaker server, you may not want to overload it with doing something else or doing that expensive thing in a microservice on your FileMaker server box. So maybe it's going to be a small Linux box uh, that you stand up to run your microservice, right? But it's going to be on the server. In the future, though, it's not going to be on the server, right? In the future, these things are going to be Docker images. In the future, FileMaker server is going to be a set of Docker images, right? Um, if if you, um, th there was a studio presentation not too long ago. Actually, we talked about this at, at Engage You uh, as well, right? So I won't get in, into that, but. Docker images, Docker's are containers, right? They're self-contained things that are almost servers, like almost virtual machines, but not quite, uh, that can execute things, right? So uh, as soon as you have multiple doc Dockers, then Kubernetes comes into, into play uh, because that's the thing that orchestrates Dockers and spins them up, spins them down, does load balancing. And this is typically where uh, my Famica developers, their eyes glaze over. Well, like, yeah, this is way beyond me. And yes, it is, right? I never expect any FileMaker developer to become proficient at Docker's containers, orchestration of containers. That's really a DevOps function. Um, so we shouldn't we shouldn't feel the need or, or, or feel the trepidation to say, oh, I got to learn all that stuff. You don't, right? You just need to be aware that this is how these things will get deployed in the future. Um, because in the future, Instead of having a microservice that FileMaker server talks to, and the microservice has a bunch of functions that we we declared and that they can execute that, we can call them. Each function becomes an API call that we do from inside FileMaker. Uh, we're going to go here, right, where we will have functions that are defined that we don't really care where they are and how they're run. We're just going to call them. And you may be thinking, ah, I see where you're going there, Wim. That's what Amazon, well, that's what AWS Lambda is all about, right? Yes, that's exactly what that is. And Google has them, Azure has them. And you're probably going like, yeah, cloud stuff, right? I, my clients are may not be ready for integrating with stuff in the cloud. Maybe they want to do all prem. Functions as a service, because that's what Lambda and Azure functions and Google functions are. Functions as a service doesn't need to be in the cloud, right? There's this thing called OpenFAS that you can deploy on-prem, which gives you exactly the same thing. If you haven't looked at it, again, I could do a presentation on nothing but this. This is actually the UI of OpenFAS. And I have actually, it's running right over there uh, on some of my Raspberry Pis. This is the UI, uh, maybe a little small, but uh, this is how you define a function. Uh, you write your JavaScript code, you basically then say, make a Docker image out of that. You don't need to know how that's done, but you write a, a single simple JavaScript function. It gets Dockerized. And when you're done, uh, open files will take care of running the, the containers and spinning them up, doing health checks, all of that. At the end of the day, what's important to you is that thing that's highlighted in yellow. It's a URL endpoint that you can now call from FileMaker that will run whatever that code is that you wrote. That one function that you wrote now becomes a URL, an API call, right? That's exactly what Lambda is. If you ever worked with Lambda, that's what it is. You, you, you give it a function and they basically give you back a URL that you can call uh, for your API call. You can do all of this st stuff on-prem, right? Uh, and like I said, uh, th that one is sitting right over there, right? So that's three Raspberry Pis, uh, load balancing between them. Uh, like if two of them fail, the third one still does, it, does, it, does its own thing. Um, so open files, if, you, if you're remotely interested in this kind of 
functions as a service, uh, you can check it out. There's even a simpler version that doesn't do load balancing between it. It's called FASD. Uh, so if you want a simple version to get your feed wet, um, this is a fun one to start with um, for this functions as a service, which is where we're going with a lot of that stuff. All right. So this was the second uh, monolith definition of monolith, right? It's where we are thinking uh, or start starting to think from not doing everything in a in a. Let me rephrase that: not letting FileMaker do everything, right? Instead of every piece of functionality that our client wants, instead of writing it in FileMaker, we may be thinking of: is there an opportunity, or should we, for performance scalability? Um, resilience reasons, uh, is there an opportunity to not do that in FileMaker and throw it at a microservice? Or if you want to go with the flow of the future a little bit to consider doing this as a function as a service. So that's sort of like where we're going with, with this particular breaking up the monolith, right? So what we're looking for there is um, solve problems, but not solve problems, big solve problems like accounting, uh, S3 bucket storage or things like that. It's more functional. It's smaller in scale and scope uh, for which libraries exist that you can go find and uh, and do that. And it's the kind of thing that will give you inherently better performance than FileMaker. It's almost a given that when you go out and look for a library that does want a particular thing, it's going to do that particular thing much faster than FileMaker can. You still have to account for getting the data there and getting the data back. So you got to measure the whole round trip and not just the execution of whatever that library can do. But you'll find that very often, including the whole round trip, you can get serious uh, performance benefits. And you inherit features, just like with the identity providers where you inherit a lot of features, you typically inherit a lot of things like horizontal and vertical scalability, right? These things are made for that um, when you deploy them. So you get it for free. All right, so if you remember only one thing uh, from this one is don't let your solution that your customers use every day, don't let it become a turd, right? You have options. So let's let's use those options. And that's it. That's what I got for you. Cool. Thank you, Wim. Uh, any other questions from anybody? Uh, anything you want to talk about? Well, sounds like you have enough time to give that other presentation. <laughs> yeah, now, yeah, I had I a, had a question, kind of <laughs> in the uh, it, you know in the actual backing up. I've done backups where I put things in folders because you know file A only needs to be backed up once a day. It just does not get used but a little bit. How does that backup that you were showing, it's in sequence, but then you had a you know, grouping. How does that work with those that we've got scheduled? Is it, does it take each schedule and apply that formula? Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. Yeah. So parallel backups is a is an all or nothing setting on the FileMaker server, right? You either turn it on or you turn it off. But when you right. turn it on, FileMaker will will learn backup schedule by backup schedule how changes are happening between runs okay. of that, that backup schedule. Yeah, okay. I, again, I didn't know how that fit in with the, the scheduling as well. Okay, cool, got it, thanks. Yep, uh, one of the things we do for backups, for instance, is we, we very often we, we don't use FileMaker backup schedules anymore. Uh, we, we, we try to use the, the native OS or hypervisor features where you can take snapshots. And, and FileMaker Server isn't snapshot aware, so you have to be a little careful how you do that. Um, so you have to put the files in a pause state before you can run a, a snapshot, and then you got to resume them. The act of pausing is very often where you, where, where you will run into these kind of, of uh, write lock issues, right? Because FileMaker Server cannot pause a file until all of the inter interactions with the file are cleared up. So if you have a very busy file, um, and you have these queued up write locks that need to happen, a uh, FileMaker server may give up on the pause where you say, I, I want to pause this file, but you got so many queued of these uh, write locks still queued up, uh, I can't pause this file. Um, so it's it's an interesting conundrum sometimes.
Go ahead, Darren. Yeah, I just wanted to comment. You opened up talking about how your post in the community about best practices. More to it, sir. I think there should be more of us making voices like yourself about best practices. Um, as a community, we, we tend to say it's not necessary, but if we want to seat at the table with a lot of the IT, we need to be able to say we run best practices. We need to be able to say we work with APIs. We need to say we've been learning new technologies. And if we walk into a meeting and say to, you know, another development team, here is the postman environment and collection for the data API, you just get smiles, you know, and that's another thing you need to do us on for your, you know, for what you've done with the, the postman side of things. Um, it just gives us a better seat at the table, you know, and there is a little bit of resistance of, as you mentioned, this is how I've always done it. And so it's a little bit scary, but the, the whole point of the APIs is to make it easier. You know, once, if anyone's looking to learn a new API, I'd recommend Stripe. The online documentation, once you are at an account, it actually adds in your details into the help documents. And it starts to be almost a copy and paste. I'm not talking chat GTP copy and paste, but it, it's a very good way to learn a new API or pick one of the weather APIs um, as well that, that you need to do. So absolutely keep going, Wim. You know, you've got the support of a lot of us out there on the best practices. Thanks, Darren. Uh, and yeah, thank you for that. Um, I, I agree. Uh, it's one of my favorites. Uh, uh, ways of spending my time because I get called in these meetings all the time, right? Where we have to defend FileMaker for big IT, or 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 there's there's a mixed project where the other team is used to all sort of all sorts of ways of of working in a particular way that that don't quite fit well with FileMaker, but you can make it work, right? It's just a matter of understanding, uh, and I love those kind of meetings, right? Because we have so many things in the FileMaker platform. It's it's why I push on external authentication so much, right? Because it's it's an easy win, right? Like we don't need to fight IT over anything like that. We'll go like, okay, what identity provider do you want me to use? I'll use it, right? And and away you go. And you get instant smiles and, and you get instant credibility by, by doing these things. Tony? Um, thank you. So Wim, at the top of the conversation, you said that uh, you, you you know you see a lot of solutions that come in mm -hmm. that uh, don't look so swell, uh, and I know you said it depends. <laughs> that said, uh, I'm wondering if you if you've got like a short list of the things that you see that uh, maybe somebody did on their first project that made FileMaker look bad, that you know we as a community should. Strong, more strongly message on, you know, when you see a poorly designed solution and you're like, oh man, they did the X, Y, Z wrong again. I'm wondering if there's like a short list. I mean, I'll, I'll start it off by saying relationship graphs that are a little nutty. Uh, that's the thing that we see when, you know, we unravel a few solutions from time to time. I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on that. Yeah. The, the uh, uh... I was going to say my number one, but it really depends on what solution you're looking at, which, what's the number one. But yes, uh, like the, the spider graph is 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 chief among those. Uh, cramming everything into a single file is, is high up on that list. Um, why tables, right? Tables that have four, 600, 800 fields um, where, where the developer fails to understand that FileMaker always works with a complete record no matter what you do, right? Um, um, very close up to that is an over-reliance on calculated fields, right? So that then become unstored calculations or summary fields. Um, uh, these kinds of things are, are, are the things that, that tend to become dogs, right? It's, um, and I'm gonna caveat, we can no dogmas, right? Like cal calculated fields are a feature, so we should use them where they fit. Summary fields are a feature, we should use them where, they're, where they fit. Um, but we see very often where, uh, and to some extent, it's the nature of 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 our our population, right? The, the FileMaker developers tend to be people that come from the business side, understand their business really well, and have discovered this great tool that can help them build something quickly, um, but not necessarily well, right? Uh, or not necessarily well something that will withstand the future, um, because typically it will work well until it doesn't. Um, 
And, and that's why when I said these undos then become very difficult, right? It's one of those where, and hopefully maybe AI can help with that because I know the question came up when we were talking about AI with Claris is at some point you, you'd wish that that for all of the handholding that, that Claris wants to do within the product that it can tell you like, if you go down, if you continue to go down this path you got to be a little careful, right? Like if you keep adding unstored calculations to this, yeah, I got to think about that a little bit. But but those those are chief among the the the, the common mistakes that I find that make a, a a solution suffer. That sounded like a good list to me. Uh, I will I will add uh, a couple to that, and that is in the past, um, people people were managing their own servers. And people were on prem, and low and and on a, a local area networks, and uh, you know, I mean, there are there, the big companies have been around for a long time, but a lot more activity was being done locally for systems. So you know, uh, systems would be built, people would use them locally, and and FileMaker performs really well on a LAN, but then things started to change. Servers started to go. Like, well, we don't need the server. Let's put it in the cloud. You get it in the cloud. You're you're in a WAN environment now. It's a different ball game. Like, if your network speed is you know half decent, you still have to contend with latency and and all these issues. And uh, and then and then things started to really show uh, show you know cracks in the in the foundation, where it's like, wow, this is taking a long time. It, you know, last time whenever I would run this in the office. It would, you know, just a couple of seconds. Now it takes like a whole minute to run this report. You know what I mean? It's, and and I think that's that's something that, um, you know, I think uh, I pointed it out to Wim uh, at the start of the the meeting, which is a, a slide that you had, which is, you know, I built my solution and it was great, but then, you know, I hosted it and people used it and they told me it was awful. You know, so I think those those are things that we find often. Yep. And th there's two, two more that now that I think of it. One, uh, one, one is tied to that trend that I said, where even smaller companies with outsourced IT now start to behave like big IT. And it's closely related to something that you say, Vince, where um, when, when we come from, from, on, from uh, bare metal machines, like on-prem bare metal machines, uh, there was a process by which you, you there, like we'd be involved in picking that machine at some point. And we go like, yeah, you, you got to go with that machine or that machine. Now with IT spinning up virtual machines or going into the cloud and spinning up virtual machines, one of the things we find is that you can't really blame them, but these IT departments are going to try to cram as many virtual machines on a physical host as they can. And, and we see this all the time where the developers say, go talk to IT, we need a FileMaker server, or we need a server uh, to run FileMaker server on, and then it becomes dog slow. And then you go look at it and, and you go like, yeah, it's a one core machine with, with four gigs of RAM, right? Like, what do you expect? This is never going to run, right? Um, because developers are not always well, well, well armed to say, these are the resources that I want, or this is the resources that my solution needs. Because, because uh, how do you know that? Like, uh, by, by looking at the logs or, or having some experience with all of these things, um, and, and again, that that's that's a whole other topic right there. How do you interpret the logs to figure out some of these things? Um, but it's it's a real thing um, to to uh, to uh, to to come to grips with. Uh, how do you how do you as a developer get into the, into these conversations? And how do you push back on these things when IT says no, no, this is all what we're giving to you, right? Um, the 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 other one is, and I see this often is. For developers to fall into a trap with perform script on server, right? Because as a developer, you're the only one. You got your development server, and everything's faster by by using perform script on server. In production, that's not a guarantee, right? If your server is already busy, you may be slowing things down by 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 overusing perform script on server, right? It's not a it's not the performance guarantee or performance benefits that you may be getting. From from what you get as a single developer running uh, uh, as the only user against your development box, we see that often, right? And and that could be a, a somewhat difficult to undo as well because the developer has gone down a whole road of 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 changing things over to perform script on server, only to find that it's not necessarily as as fast as as they thought it would be. 
Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, that's a good point. Um, you just uh, reminded me of something. And uh, I'm not the fastest developer, but everything I do, I always test. And I may be making slow progress, but I have a lot of confidence in my code. And I watch some developers, they just like blaring down this path to, to hell. And it's like, I, you know, I wrote code, I, I know it, it's going to work, no problem, never tested. Then it comes around to, to run it, and it's like, oh, it doesn't work. Oh, now I have to debug it. So now I got to break down and, you know, look at it. this part, that part doesn't work, that part. And it's like, you could have just tested everything you wrote when you wrote it to, conf to get the confidence in the code that you're laying that it's all going to work. And I see like that, that that's often a big mistake of people who, I don't know, they just, they feel like a lot of self-confidence and they're, they're really talented. They can't be bothered to test. And it's like, I can move really quickly. I don't want to be bogged down to have to like test every single thing that I do. But I, I find, I don't know, maybe I'm old school and maybe I just take longer, but it just, sometimes I don't have to deal with all that. I don't know how everybody else feels, but. Maybe they haven't seen what we've seen, Vince, you know, to, to know what could go wrong, what could possibly go wrong. I've sent out a couple of thousand SMS messages in 18 seconds. You know, there was like 20,000 sent from the server because my loop was wrong. You know, we've seen yeah. these things. <clears throat> so mm -hmm. it's one of those parts. Um, when we talk a speed of system working remote, I think there's a big misconception that if my internet speed from my workstation to my ISP is fast, then the speed to an access to the web or the file maker system on the web is going to be fast. Um, it's the latency between my desk or my file maker client to the file maker server. You know, there, there's a lot of points of failure and slowdown that can happen between those two. So rather than just testing, okay, I've got my internet speed for the client, he's, he's got a one meg download, that's great. But if he's sitting on the other side of the world and there's a lot of hops, the latency may be up around two, 300. Um, and as you start to get a lot of unstored calcs, it's going to slow down. Whether right. you're running perform script on server or any other function, as soon as he starts talking unstored, you're going to slow down. That's just it. Yep. So, yeah, I think that unstored calc is pretty high up on my list as well. The, the unstored thing also brings up the topic of multiple calls. So because it's unstored, it has to probably have another call to go fetch the data to calculate what it needs to calculate in most in most situations. And that other call is going to be then um, impacted by the fact that you've got a really high latency. And so that compounds the issue. That's why, you know, unstored calcs are like, you know, rubbing rubbing salt into oh, a wound or whatever. And, and we Absolutely. have some really, yeah, and we have some great tools. Yep. When we were in, in the Engage U in, in the European conference, we had the, the performance panel and 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 we, we talked about some, some of these things. Uh, we have the remote calls feature flag that we can turn on the client and or on the server. Uh, so if you really want to see what's what some of the calls are that the client has to make to server for some of the actions, we can, right? It's a bit of a... It's a bit of a dark art sometimes to interpret that, uh, but but with some common sense, you can at least see what kind of calls you're generating under different scenarios with these things. So we get a lot of tools. We, as a community, and, and with the help of Clara's a little bit, because we need somewhat better documentation, but as a community, we need to talk about these things a little more, right? Where we show these things, where we say, these are the tools at our disposal that we can we can use to see exactly. We don't need to guess at some of these things because we can see it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like even with the admin console, if you're doing a heavy search with unstored calcs, open up the admin console, run the search yourself, and see what happens to the CPU or the server. If you if you're taking something from ten percent to eighty percent, and I've seen it happen on a report that was taking some of the users twelve minutes to run because it was all unstored. And you'd watch the admin console and it would just spike. That particular report was restructured to be all stored data, 12 seconds and 12 minutes did not affect the CPU or the server. And every time someone ran it and it got to 80%, everyone else slowed down. And 
an understanding of the Draco engine and how the FileMaker server works that if you do push your scripts off to perform on server, whether or not the server is going to handle them synchronously or asynchronously or whether or not it's like the DMV where although they've gone to the server, they're still queued up. You know, you're still in the DMV queue for licenses. You're not in a different queue for getting, you know, a test done or something like that. So you're still queuing them up. So how the server will distribute those calls can also give you performance hits as well. So unstored calcs is my big bump for, for speed. Yep. Jim, you had a question? Uh, yeah, I was going to build on what uh, Vince was saying, and actually multiple folks. Uh, probably the worst situation we've been having recently is uh, our company has been moving more services, including the production Oracle services, off to the government uh, AWS cloud. Uh, however, there's still a lot of ARM on-prem uh, VMs uh, in the VM sphere virtual environment. Uh, and so services where we used to synchronize and maintain uh, cache tables, especially for performance, uh, because they were connecting to Oracle views anyway that were run on a schedule. So that really you didn't need live data. Now, what we found is, is that with this hybrid environment, uh, things that used to take a minute or five, 10 minutes now take 20 minutes, two hours in one case, something that took about 10 minutes now takes two hours to run, uh, become completely impractical. Uh, and so uh, in some cases, we're actually going to have to set up our VMs uh, for our uh, servers on the same uh, web service uh, as the uh, production uh, Oracle services, just so they can talk to each other, because theoretically, there's bigger pipes in between uh, those environments where those are implemented uh, than our on-prem stuff. But yes, you can run into this, this hybrid environment between on-prem and off-prem resources can be very challenging and much slower, and you have to test it. Yep, yep, absolutely. Yes. To, to, to Vince's point there, uh, it's funny because it come it has come up internally with us as well, uh, like like the the code quality and the testing, because because sometimes it's just an illusion of speed, right? Because you think you're moving linearly faster to 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 your development tasks, but you're really not. Because at the tail end, if something goes wrong or, or somebody else has to back test it, at the end of the day, you're not saving any time whatsoever. Uh, and and Perform Script on Server is a good example of that, where uh, in code review, I, I see it happen. I'm going like, but there's no defensive coding around that. Like, what if the what if you exceed your number of perform script on server sessions on the server, or the FileMaker server scripting engine has died? You'll get an error. What do you do? Right? Do you turn around and and run the same logic uh, locally? Do you loop and wait? How long do you wait? What do you do if 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 you wait for if you set out to wait for five seconds and after five seconds, what do you do, right? There's now a whole slew of the decisions you need to make just by virtue of you wanting to use Perform Sipton Server that you have to take into account when you write the code. And you have to write the code for, for those eventualities where it's not available. Um, so it's it's not a simple, oh, I can throw it to the server and, and I'm done. Just, uh, hey, Riff. I'm sorry, Vince. You know, uh, just riffing on the PSOS thing. One of the architectures that I've heard discussed in the uh, user groups, and we're implementing on a big kind of enterprise class solution, is leveraging the um, a Q file, uh, whatever the you know where you certain tasks that you want to get off the desktop. Maybe it's sending an email, um, sending a PDF report, or whatever things that you can just push into a queue, um, you know, just lightens the load on the PSOS. Um, just a thought. Yeah, it's uh, actually, I wrote a blog post uh, only a couple of weeks ago with like a queuing mechanism that is smart enough to figure out at what point you can have uh, enough concurrency. Um, the a, a queue is, is, a, is a great tool, right? Uh, because it allows you to throttle and all of that stuff. Um, 
by putting everything in a queue, if you look at the overall amount of work that needs to be done, it's going to be slower than if you could have some concurrency uh, uh, or some parallelism, if you will, in there, right? So, so the trick becomes, at what point does trying to do things in parallel slow everything down to the point that by trying to do things in parallel, you're now slower than doing things sequentially. So finding that balance can be a lot of fun, um, but it's it's sometimes worthwhile trying to figure that one out. Um, yeah, yeah, balance. Oh, I, I will I will give a shout out. To, uh, someone's got to stand up for unstored calcs. And uh, Wim, I know you already said not dogmatic. So uh, <laughs> there are, you know, sometimes you walk into these uh, solutions that don't have this uh, pristine ability to, uh, you know, set your subtotal of your invoice or whatnot. Um, we have, and I'll say it on the record, we're being recorded. We have from time to time <laughs> made good use of uh, unstored calcs to make sure that, uh, you know, because it is a definitive answer. Uh, and as long as you're sort of uh, using those fields somewhat on demand, certainly a summary of an unstored calc uh, could be a disaster. Uh, and that should not be just hanging out on a layout. Uh, but, you know, you can make it work. Uh, unstored calcs. I'll stand up for them. Someone's got to. <laughs> oh, you got to know the rules before you break them. And you know there you the rules, go. Tony. That's it. You know? I know they run it's, slow. It's, they're not fun to search on. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah but, they, there's, but they're there's very a... accurate and they're very up to date. Yeah. And, and, they, oh, yeah. and they keep you away from any, you know, they save you like the perils of uh, record locking when you're writing to multiple oh. tables yeah. and all that kind of stuff. And if you're just walking in the door clean, they'll get you through the day and you can, uh, you know, keep, they give you a decent starting point. Bacon yeah, and look, eggs. The exception proves the rule. Yeah, the exception proves the rule every time, you know? I'll stand up for repeating mm -hmm. fields. You know, I've got my repeating fields as the devil T-shirt in the cupboard here somewhere. You know, the, good for the, time the, zones. Diego was here. The, the, I use, the, them, I use them for my time zone map to see to see uh, what's mm -hmm. up in Australia. Yep. yep. Thank uh, you for that. Yeah, please, developers, develop for different time zones in the world when you're putting a solution together. You know, do it from the start. It, it helps all of us. We're all we're a worldwide community now. Um, but yeah, again, another bugbear is using global variables to store data to send between scripts and not coding defensively where you are not clearing out that global variable when you're finished. You're just assuming the next script step is going to hit that global variable and reset it, not take that previous record's data into the next record. You see that a lot as well. You know, it's mm. script press, local variables and fields. You know, it's almost like some of the methodology of global fields has been directly translated to global variables, you know, to, mm. to work with things. I, I find but, yeah, uh, well, 100. I, what's that? Uh, I find the um, interesting to um to look at solutions that people build that know some design some database design like sch schema knowledge you know and they and they and they really really normalize it they think oh my god this is perfect i i have the uh the product id and i only have it here and and if i need the product id i can look it up uh, it's three hops away and oh that's beautiful right so not fully normalized and uh and when I look at systems like that, Inspector has this option to show um, hops for fields and relationships and, and value lists and uh, all that kind of stuff. So it shows you how many hops um, a field that is on a layout needs to resolve to get that data. And sometimes, you know, someone says, oh, this, this client is having a problem. It's really slow. And I'll just get the DDR, run it. And then I'll just go look at that. And it's like, oh, yeah. I, I see it's it's it could be really slow. You've got like six hops away. You have fields on a layout from six hops away. I remember Clay saying something like after five five relationships, they don't they don't cache the relationship or or the join or whatever. And then it's just gotta do that work at the time. And it's like that's just 
unbelievably going to be a disaster. But yep, and then and then you see the um, refresh window script that has the checkbox on to refresh all the case joints and also the external data because who's ever done it hasn't understood both of them. And then they've got this big relationship graph that's got 30 tables hanging off it and it will go and refresh all of them just because yeah. the data was coming back from six, six hops away. Yep. Anyway, uh, I also want to be respectful of, of um, Wim's time because he's three hours ahead. So it's getting late for him and um, I want to just kind of look to wrap up here. Anybody else have any closing remarks or, or questions for Wim? Wouldn't it be funny? Uh, th thanks for the glass? presentation. That's my closing yeah. comment. Thank you. That was uh, really, really good. And yeah. and putting on the show, take it, him. Yes. My pleasure. So uh, anytime, like I said, the, I, I mentioned there's a couple more that I can give around the same topic on on how to do things practically and uh, always, always up for for sharing some of that stuff. All right. Thank you. Right, right Thank now. you, Wim. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a great night. Right Have a happy holidays. You and, too. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Wim. We'll look forward to seeing each other in person in Austin. Take care, Absolutely. everyone. Bye now. Bye. Bye. Bye.